Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the fact that the conveyor belts of history work and that once the Holy Spirit begins to woo a person toward the Lord Jesus Christ and that person responds, you move all of history to get the gospel to that person or the truth doctrinally to that individual. We uh, have such cases here and we're grateful. And Lord, that's why we're here this morning, because you've brought us to this place where we can learn the truth, and we pray that it might be accurately represented this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Now, we will finish Operation Footstool, I, I promise just going to have to put my foot down and get it done. But um, after our uh, flood here at uh, uh, the church, and by the way, we want to thank uh, Zed and Nancy Ferries and Stan uh, Ballard and Diana Walters for uh, being able to, to be here and help uh, clean that up so we could meet. Uh, but after our flood and after some uh, people have said, boy, things just seem to be getting a little rough little difficult. More and more I'm having uh, uh, problems and uh, they are beginning to wear me out, weigh me down, uh, and uh, give up itis begins setting in. And these are things that we all have to face. There's not a one of us that's exempt. I thought maybe we just better focus in on Someone that we have mentioned before, but have never really taken time uh, to, um, to understand, and that is the person of Job. Uh, Job is really one of the most mature believers in all of the Bible. He is mentioned with two others uh, who were uh, some of the most fantastic people that have ever believed God's message and have stood for him. So we're going to look at the life of Job, especially with regard to what's called evidence testing. Now, why is that important to you? Because you are going to be called upon to give evidence testing. And whether you uh, succeed or fail uh, depends upon the doctrine you know and apply and uh, whether or not God is glorified with your life. Now, we will define evidence testing. We'll tell you what it is and uh, how it's going to impact you in the life of Job. Now, Job, uh, as far as the book is concerned, is unique. It's the oldest book in the Bible. We say, Pastor, wait one second. Moses wrote about uh, in the beginning, God created. Yes, that's true. Moses dealt with subject matter that was older than the book of Job. But Moses didn't live until hundreds of years after Job lived, and the book of Job was written first. So therefore, it is unique. He lived probably around the time of Abraham, when Abraham was in the Ur of the Chaldees. The second thing about Job, uh, in its distinctiveness, is that it unveils some things unlike no other book regarding the appeal trial of Lucifer. In the angelic conflict, there was a trial, the lake of fire was created, and God was going to throw these rebel angels in there, but there was an appeal. And man was created. That's why you're here, really. Uh, you, you might think, oh boy, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm just the object of God's love. God couldn't do without me, and so therefore he created me and, and, and the like. And that's nonsense. That's part of it. But the first reason why you're here is so that Jesus Christ could have an inferior race to enter into to prove to the prior created angels that he is worthy of ruling the universe. All of the other things are subsequent to that main purpose. He is going to be made lower than the angels for the suffering of death that he might rule uh, over all. Okay, so that brings us to our first point in our study. Now on the first part of the page, this is going to be an abbreviated study. We have a basic outline. And on the back side, uh, we have a, uh, a drawing that we will eventually get to to show how Job's life um, 
is going to illustrate your life in what we might call Operation Divine Hedge and uh, the Hedge Clippers, because that's exactly what, what Lucifer got God to do. Remove the protective barriers between Job and himself so that he might test Job. Uh, so point number one, we're in Genesis chapter three, all human suffering, regardless of its category, is linked to the angelic revolt. Uh, Lucifer got one third of the angels, and we'll just mention this because we've studied it so much before, but one third of the angels to follow him in a rebellion against Jesus Christ. They were uh, rounded up, they were brought to trial, they were found guilty, and just before they were thrown into the lake of fire, Lucifer brought his object objection, and um, the appeal trial ensued. Now, we are part of the appeal trial, and just like in any other trial, there is a judge, there are conditions, rules to go by, there are witnesses, and uh, there are ways to find out the truth. And so we're going to, to look at that. But very, one of the very first things in this appeal trial is that God created a perfect man, inferior to the angels, but had some very similar characteristics. Number one, intelligence. Number two, rationality. Number three, a volition. He could understand concepts and he could make decisions based on that understanding. And so he was created and God said, don't eat of the tree, but you can eat of this tree. Here is uh, the tree of life. Here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't eat of that or you'll die. So man joined the angelic conflict when he ate of that tree. But now, just as soon as he ate from that tree, God had to do something. Verse 17. Unto Adam he said, Because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Uh, in sorrow you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it's going to bring forth to thee, and you'll eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you'll eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. Dust you are, dust you shall return. Now, whether we like it or not, the minute we are conceived, we come under this Adamic curse. And uh, it, oftentimes, and, and, and in most cases, it's okay, but we pray about the God um, addressing physical ailments in our bodies. And we, we say, oh God, uh, you know, uh, please help me get over this. Uh, I'm sick here. I don't feel good there. I know myself often uh, you, you get uh, um, in pain and I, I look back and I regret I ever played football. If I, if I had thought that I would never make it big in football back at that time, I would have never played. I would have given myself over to other pursuits, which would have been far more beneficial. But I gave my body back then. They don't tell you when you hit 40 and you play football that your joints <laughs> begin to disintegrate and, uh, and you begin living in pain. You wake up in the morning and you start heading for the aspirin bottle or whatever it takes. Any other kind of bottle to get rid of the pain? No, I don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm saying that that is all linked with Lucifer's fall and Adam's fall. And as a result, we want a buffer zone, a comfort zone, where we'll have no pain, where we can live in this life free from, from any difficulties, especially with regard to our circumstances roundabout, with our physical health and, and the confidence we have, say now as we're believers, in God. What just so happened that those are the three areas where Satan attacked Job. And it is not just simply a coincidence that there is a whole book devoted to the evidence testing of Job. The reason being, you're going to be tested this way in those three areas. Your surrounding circumstances, which provide a hedge, a barrier between Lucifer and yourself. 
I mean, as long as that hedge is there and Lucifer has to stay outside of your particular little garden, uh, oh, that's fine, that's fine, okay, sure. Oh, yeah, the world can be attacked, but not me. You got your hedge up. And then the second one, well, as long as I've got my health, and of course, there's not a one of us that don't want to be okay. And it is not wrong to go to a doctor. It's not wrong to take a pill to help you overcome these things. It's not wrong to do that. But what I'm saying is we don't want to suffer any of that. And then lastly, whenever we are injured or wronged, and I'm speaking of myself, I'm a test case here myself, we immediately want to lash out. We want to come back. We want to justify ourselves. We're not wrong. We did it right. And we, and we begin lashing out at other people who condemn us and accuse us when in the long run, what God really wants is if we're doing it right, just to trust him appeal to the Supreme Court of Heaven and let God deal with the people who are condemning and accusing you. Uh, Jesus Christ is a good example of this. When he reviled, what does scripture say? He reviled not again. Uh, when he came before uh, his, uh, his accusers as a sheep, he opened not his mouth. Uh, he, 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 didn't, he didn't say a word. He just, um, he just uh, as a sheep before his shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. He didn't say a word. But he committed himself to him that judges righteously, which just simply means he was a perfect man. He had done nothing wrong. If he was asked questions by authorities, he would answer those questions. But he wouldn't begin attacking them just to try to get off the hook. He wouldn't just try to justify himself in the, in the long run and forget that he was here in the angelic conflict to glorify God in those circumstances. Okay, so when we come to Genesis 3, we have to remember that when it says in verse 17, cursed is the ground for your sake, and then verse 19, in the sweat of your face, you'll eat of it till you return to the ground, that that is what's going on. We are beginning the process of returning back to dust, and that causes pain and difficulty. Come to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, as you're turning to Romans chapter 8, I'm not saying that it is wrong to answer your accusers, but you do not rail against them uh, in an attempt to justify yourself. Nor... If it just seems to take God a long time, we cannot become bitter against God in saying to him, now wait a minute, Buster. You know, I've been, I've been going through this a month. I've been going through this three months. This, this, it's taken you a year. And you have another thing about this situation. And I have to keep living under these irritating and ad, uh, aggravating circumstances. And you could justify them. You could vindicate me in an instant. Why don't you say something? Why don't you act on my behalf? Now, finally, in the third evidence test, as we'll see, that's where Job lost it. We talk of the patience of Job. Job's patience began running out. And this is the, finally the area after so long where he finally began to ask God, okay, look, uh, how long is this going to be? Why don't you just take me? And he began cursing the day that he was born uh, because of, of his pain. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Uh, let's go to verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. You see, poor little deer out there, little bunny rabbits and squirrels, they die. Uh, they didn't do anything wrong, but yet they age and they die and they suffer and so forth. Why? Because when man sinned, God uh, cursed the whole of creation so that we're all in this together. For the creation was made subject to vanity. 
And the vanity it simply means um, uh, returning back to dust. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Here was man. I'm going to kick God out of his own creation, and I'm going to be the master of my own destiny and fate. And God said, guess what? You can kick me out, but in so doing, I'm going to curse the creation so that no matter what you do, you can't keep it forever. You might build an empire and you might amass houses and lands and all the possessions you want, but there's going to come a time when you're going to begin the aging process and you're going to begin to have pain. And you're going to begin to head into eternity without any hope or without any help of living forever. And all of those uh, uh, possessions that you now have are going to be meaningless because you're going to die and turn to dust. And when you turn to dust, you cannot grab a hold of those possessions. You can't take it with you. How much did he leave behind? He left it all. And that's the whole point. So, uh, verse number 21. Finally, creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. The whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. But verse 23, last part, we're waiting for the adoption. What is that? The redemption of our body. We're not going to live in a painless environment until the resurrection and the establishment of a new universal order. Okay, let's go back then to the book of Job. Chapter 1. Now, here we are in the midst of a world that is destined for, for pain. But now we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, or like Job, um, become a believer in the message God had for him at that time. And God began blessing his spiritual maturity. That's actually what God blesses. Uh, if a person has a fortune and they're an unbeliever or a carnal believer and they have a lot of wealth, that wealth is not a blessing to them. Uh, because that, that wealth is something that they are depending on in order to see them through. And all of a sudden, when they uh, either are in pain or begin dying and, and the like, um, uh, or the wealth dissipates, then they have no resources. They have no confidence. Where do I go from here? Everything is taken away. So we look into Job chapter 1 and look at verse number 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, these are the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Okay, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. From whence comest thou? Satan answered, from going to and fro and up and down in the earth. Okay, now this lets us know that the angelic appeal trial convenes on a regular basis. What is the angelic appeal trial? Well, Satan is trying to prove himself worthy to rule, and he is trying to put down Christ and all believers who will eventually be the heirs of God and rule in eternity future. So, God calls all of the angels, good and bad, together to be observers in the appeal trial. The book of Daniel calls them watchers. Uh, the apostle Peter says that... Um, the angels are rubbernecking, looking to see just how in the world God could provide salvation for uh, these people, uh, these human beings, an inferior race. And then Paul says in, in the book of Ephesians that the angels learn the multifaceted wisdom of God from human beings. 
Well, if all of this learning is going on by angelic observation, that means there's activity going on in the human race amongst believers and unbelievers. Now, who is the prosecution here in this court trial? It's God, of course. So God is the prosecutor. He is the one who is going to prove that Satan is ultimately uh, guilty and that his son is ultimately worthy to be worshipped and to rule. Who is the defense? Well, the name itself is a title. Um, a trial lawyer. <laughs> He's the defense lawyer. Satan. All of them come together on a regular basis as, as the uh, human race and human history progresses. Because people are born and they die, uh, they have new test cases as, the, uh, as uh, history moves along. So what's a test case condition? Because Satan and the angels cannot necessarily discern all things like God can, cannot probe the depths of, of a person's heart like God can, God had to bring about a situation where these angels could observe man in the actual experience itself. Now, the concept of the test case condition is, is not um, my own. It comes from Lewis Berry Schaefer, who said, the human race is a test case condition, and each individual person contributes to it one way or the other. Where God puts an individual through an experience and, and has a, um, uh, a, a dossier on them, uh, has a file on them, with all of their experiences and all of their responses or reactions listed. But not just is he doing that, there are observers to the situation as they move along. And they're called together to this for the test case conditions. Now that uh, brings us therefore to point number three. Job had test case conditions or, or approaching test case conditions when the angelic trial, appeal trial, was convened. Okay, note verse number eight. It says, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? This is this is Job 1, verse 8. Now here's the point. After Adam, Satan began his gesture of possession. Do you remember what that is? We learned it from Operation Footstool. One day, we're going to do that. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do that. Put all his enemies under his feet. And when Lucifer took the title deed of the earth back from Adam... He began just skipping along, up and down, to and fro, all over the earth. This is mine. I got it back from man, and so forth. But now remember, uh, he can only keep the earth uh, uh, until he ab ultimately wins it at the end of the 7,000 years, or until Christ comes and reclaims it and takes it back from him. In between time, there are people who naturally belong there, Unbelievers, they're his children. They're, they're part of the old Adamic race and fall. And now believers who are going to take it over. And believers especially are called upon to present evidence testing by God to show that they deserve this uh, to rule and own the world and that Lucifer and all of his companions and all of his children do not deserve to have it. So here, here he comes from skipping all over this planet. He comes into the presence of God. They convene court. The gavel is, is, a, is a hit. And all of a sudden God leans over. Where have you been, Satan? I've been skipping up and down or to and fro over all the earth. It's mine, you know. I want it from Adam. And the first thing he did, have you considered Job? Now, I can just, I, I, I was not there. I was not even born yet. But I can just imagine under Satan's breath, he said, I, I knew he's going to bring him up. 
Uh, I, I know about Job, but uh, I wasn't going to say anything if God wasn't. Have you considered him? There's none like him in all of the earth. You can't produce anyone that is as good as Job and is as deserving of blessing as Job. You can't do it. Have you considered him? What was God doing? He was calling him to the witness stand. Now, again, all of this was happening behind the scenes, but God himself mentioned Job. Now, remember, we just had the study of the aggressive believer. What does the Apostle Paul want as a prize in eternity future? What was the prize? For God the Father to mention his name personally and call him to the highest position. That was a prize, says the Apostle Paul. Subsequent to the Bema seat, it's a prize. But it's also a prize to have God the Father consider you so worthy to be used by him. Now, <laughs> when I say that, it's going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's 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 a, it's an honor and a privilege, but it's going to hurt uh, because he doesn't have anybody else but mature believers to call in situations like this. Have you considered him? He is fantastic, and but when he does so, it means now that he is going to have to provide opportunity for Satan to have evidence testing. The whole court trial is for either the prosecution or the defense to examine the witness and then cross-examination. Lucifer does it, God cross-examines. God does it, Lucifer cross-examines. And what we have here in Job is the cross-examination of Job after God has called him to witness for the prosecution. And we have the same thing in verse number three. And it, this gives us the angelic conflict. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. A perfect and upright man. He fears God and his Jews evil, and still he holds fast his integrity. Now note this last part of verse 3. Because sometimes when you wonder, why in the world me? Why am I being persecuted? Why am I having these hard times? Here God tells us what Job was like. Fantastic man. Verse number 8 again in chapter 1. There's none like him in the earth. God the Father testified of Job's spirituality. You talk about numero uno. You talk about uh, having God respect your name and call it forth as an example. Job was that kind of fellow. What did he do? He was perfect. That means he was spiritually mature. He had learned the maximum amount of doctrine for his day. He was upright across the board in all of his dealings. He applied doctrine to his life, and therefore God called him an upright man. He was one that feared God and eschewed evil. That simply means that God was first. He was afraid of displeasing the Lord. He wanted to live for God, and he eschewed evil. What does that mean? He did not follow Satan's strategy at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to get the best of life apart from God, which is where all of the world is today. He eschewed that philosophy and strategy of life. What a believer was Job. But not only that, and as we go to chapter 2, the last part of verse 3, here is the angelic conflict. He still holds fast his integrity, although you moved me against him to destroy him without a cause. There's the conflict, because here is the question. Your son, Jesus Christ, and all of the people who believe in him are just serving you because you bless them and protect them. If you wouldn't provide for them, just remove the hedge, remove the, pos uh, the, the possessions, take away all of the blessings so that they have nothing but their life and make that life as miserable as you can and they'll curse you to your face. The only reason they serve you is because you're buying their love and you're buying their, their loyalty. Uh, uh, do, you, do you ever have people do that? I've had people, family members uh, do that. Uh, there, were, there were certain... 
certain relatives that the cousins like more than others. Uh, some of the relatives would insist that we obey uh, the, 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 um, the instructions, that we, uh, 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 our behavior would, would be exemplary, and others would just simply say, in light of it, well, let's just buy, buy them an ice cream cone, you know, buy, give them candy and so forth. Uh, don't, don't be so hard on them. And uh, we would just not want to be around these aunts and uncles and the relatives over here because they would always make us mind. But we would always be, want to be around these because all they did was buy for us. We never learned much of any of the responsibilities of life for them, but it was easy. And uh, that's, what, um, that's what Lucifer is, is uh, saying about God. You're buying them. Take it all away and they'll curse you. Okay, so uh, let's look at what might be called Operation Hedge. Okay, we're going to start with verse number nine and just uh, simply look on the, the back side of, of the paper. Here is where we get the concept of the hedge. Now, lest you think that um, this is the first time it's mentioned, it's not. The Garden of Eden had a protective barrier called a hedge around it. It delineated its boundaries. It showed how much territory Adam was personally responsible for protecting. And it also showed that, uh, that um, uh, there was there were walls between the outside and the inside to keep enemies out. And so you have the hedge. And this is where it's mentioned. Job chapter 1, verse 9. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, hey, Here's the test case condition. You're bringing him up as a witness. Why are you calling? All you've done is pampered him. I mean, all he has is blessing. Talk about King Midas. Everything he touches turns to gold. You just uh, keep on opening the windows of heaven and pouring out riches on him. Naturally, he's going to serve you. You're buying his loyalty. Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased. Put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. So here, where we, here is where we get the concept of the hedge. And the hedge was in the form of, of three barriers or three hedges. If you go to New Harmony, they have the maze or the labyrinth there. Well, this is the, the, the three hedges. One was the farthest on the outside and his surrounding circumstances. Uh, that is getting personal, but it's not as personal as the second one, his physical health. First you hit his wealth, now you hit his health. And then the third time you hit his spiritual confidence. Why? Because Satan kept the cross-examination going. And when Satan is cross-examining legitimately, what does God have to do uh, with regard to vindicating his witness? Shut up. As long as cross-examination is going on legitimately, the... Um, the opposing lawyer cannot interrupt. He must remain silent through it all until the cross-examination is over and the point is proven. And there's where we come into the concept of the silence of God, and that's where Job really stuck it out until almost the end, uh, where, where he finally failed because his patience ran out with God remaining silent. But God had to remain silent in order to allow Job to prove his point, which he eventually did. Now, the point that I'm making is those three hedges are around you as a believer, especially a mature believer in fellowship. What's going to happen when your name is presented and your surrounding circumstances are interrupted? Where Satan mows a gate right uh, through the hedge in order to get to you. And that's the whole point. He's trying to get to you. 
What about your own health? If it goes and, uh, and, and so forth, are you going to take it in stride or are you going to begin to curse God? Are you going to begin to be bitter and blame God as he mows, Satan mows down the second gate in order to get to you? And then if God postpones his vindication of your life indefinitely until the cross-examination is over, are you going to be, begin to accuse him of injustice or unfairness? Are you going to begin to accuse him of not acting in your... Well, you said you'd do this. I quote all the verses, and you have not done anything for me. Doctrine doesn't work. Living for you doesn't work. Look at all the, what the worldlings have. Look at how much fun they're having. We, we mentioned ski day. <laughs> you know, you've got thousands on the beaches in ski day. They're having a good time. It seems like it. Here we are wrestling, and we have to take Satan's guff and the world's guff. And besides that, all the barriers are down, and you're not protecting us anymore. And it just seems to get worse each and every day. Do we blame God? Or do we understand that we're on trial and we took an oath to tell the truth and that God is allowing Satan to see what we're made of? And that's what temptation and testing is all about. Think of it. The Lord Jesus Christ got baptized. The first thing the Spirit did was drive him in the wilderness, have him fast for 40 days, and then he was tempted of the devil. That Let me tell you, uh, the devil wrung him out to see uh, what he was made of. And that's what the angelic uh, conflict is all about. And that's what evidence testing is all about. Job passed, as we will see, with flying colors, all except for the third. And finally, he had to recover from that, and, uh, and he passed.